Okay. okay. So anyway, so I am recording now. But I'm gonna have to like kind of do both computers at the same time. But anyway, uh, any questions from anything last time we talked Tuesday? Covering the the beans, the kidney beans, right? I was going to show you a picture of my little girl as it relates to a story last night. I had a very medically intensive night last night. My uh, daughter, my little 15-month-old Phoebe, has, we've been trading colds back and forth amongst the house for the past couple of weeks. Uh, over spring break, I couldn't hardly talk um, because of my illness, but now she's got this kind of runny, sniffly nose, a little bit of cough. Um, and so anyway, so her mom goes to take her down, and then she brings her back out 30 minutes later, screaming, losing her mind, and she has this sound she's making when she breathes in, she goes, <gasps> what do you think about that? Croup. Sounds like croup, right? What is that? Inspiratory strider, right? Okay, so yeah, so she doesn't have the barky cough yet, but she's got the inspiratory strider. So we say, well, what are we going to do with her? We don't have any, unfortunately, any medications that would be appropriate for her at the house. But I would ask you, if I were to bring her to your house, what would you say would have been the appropriate therapy for her? What kind of steroids? IV? Now, what, what type of steroid, though? Dexamethasone is the go-to corticosteroid for croup, right? Why, does that, why do we use corticosteroids? Why do I get that strider? Right, it's upper airway swelling, right? That's why I get that inspiratory strider that occurs there. Again, it's not wheezing. Usually, it's usually uh, not a lower airway sort of thing there. So we give dexamethasone. What's the benefit of dexamethasone? has a longer half-life than something like prednisone does, right? So usually people just get a single dose of dexamethasone. They'll help to decrease that airway inflammation, help to deal with that strider, and then uh, they're good to go. So additionally, say she was even worse, she's even having a harder time moving air, she was having that really barky cough, what else could you give in addition to that? It could maybe have a little bit faster onset of action. Racemic epinephrine, right? That's where we have the inhaled, not IV, right? Because she's not coding, but the racemic epinephrine inhaled is what's going to be used there. And again, to help with that, uh, the beta 2 activity to try to help to try to uh, cause some uh, relaxation, of that, that smooth muscle, try to open things up a little bit. So she wasn't at that point, but she did get steroids and she got home and she was totally fine. Of course, I stayed home with my other daughter while the mom took her because, of course, moms want to be with their babies, right? Uh, and so I said, well, how's she doing? I was texting her and she says, oh my gosh, she's dying. She's in critical condition and sends a picture of her like happy and smiling with <laughs> Olaf the snowman and at the Nemours ER. Uh, but anyway, so that was, our, that was our night last night. In addition to me being on call for the Poison Center, which I got a few funky calls, uh, one patient who they uh, showed up to a fire department and said um, he got bit by a snake. Weren't sure what kind of snake it was, but the guy was acting kind of altered and then got sent to the ER, uh, ended up needing to be intubated. I'll talk about snakes later on, but it sounded kind of like maybe a coral snake kind of bite, which causes a, a flaccid paralysis, usually requiring intubation if they get that to that point. Um, and so they wanted to do we use antivenom or not. And I said, that's weird. So I talked to the doctor, and then he was like, oh, yeah, the guy just extubated himself like five minutes ago. He's super uh, combative, uh, despite all the said as we gave him to intubate him. I was like, ooh, that does not sound like a coral snake bite. Usually those patients do not extubate themselves because they are paralyzed. But anyway, some weird cases. Getting into this, though, I want to finish up the, the topics today and then do the Kahoot review, if possible, as much as we can um, before we have the test on Monday, right? Yep. Yeah, there you go. That's the, that's the appropriate response there. Anyway, so we're talking about specific medications and how we manage uh, acute kidney injury, uh, again, trying to prevent. Obviously, that would be the beneficial thing. Um, and then treat if need be. We're talking about several in, uh, medications that are specific, the more common to cause acute kidney injury, things like aminoglycosides, things like contrast-induced um, nephropathies, uh, cisplatin. Amphotericin is another one we mentioned that we use for more invasive fungal infections. You see this a lot in critically ill patients who already are going to have propensities towards acute kidney injuries due to hyperperfusion, etc. And so because of that, when they receive this, amphotericin B is very, very good at helping to um, disrupt the fungal cell walls to try to, to kill those, those uh, fungal cells. However, it's not entirely specific for the fungus, so it will affect our cells as well. And the kidney tends to be one of those uh, areas that tends to get hurt more. Um, and so you're going to find that by causing uh, interstitial damage, you're going to find things like uh, an inability to concentrate the urine appropriately. So that's where you get the inability to concentrate things. Even the urine output may be okay. You know, GFR might look okay. You're still losing a lot of potassium. You're losing sodium, magnesium, and you can get this renal tubular acidosis mainly because you're not reabsorbing bicarb like you should. Okay, 
So we can see all these things, and typically the bigger the dose you're getting, the longer you're receiving it, the more likely you are to see that. Now, what are some ways we can get around that? Well, one way we can try to do is use that liposomal amphotericin, so we can actually change the dosage form a little bit, to try to make it a little bit more kind to the kidneys. And so when I say liposomal, anyone know what that means? I've talked about it briefly before, maybe like back in pharmacodynamics. Basically, if you think about the, the phospholipid bilayer, right? Remember, all of our cells are made up of those phospholipid bilayers. You can make these little micelles, these little tiny uh, balls of these phospholipids and actually implant them with the drug. And so by doing that, for whatever reason, it tends to have less effect on the renal cells. It still has a very good ability to kill the fungal cells, but it doesn't have as much problem on us. However, what do you think that does to the cost? You have this specially engineered medication now. Super expensive, right? Way more expensive than you would see with, uh, say, just regular conventional amphotericin piece. That's one thing we can try. Um, but again, the best thing you can do, and again, here's an example of what this looks like, right? This is my cells. Again, I should probably go to the next slide on here as well. And you would see um, that you're going to have that my cell there. It's that fossil living bilayer. You see the little drug molecules kind of implanted in there. It's a, a common tactic we'll do for drugs that tend to be um, certain chemo drugs we'll do that with that are particularly cardiotoxic. We'll do this with this for, for amphotericin. And so the, the main thing here is that one, um, we can use this uh, form of therapy. That's going to be great. Um, we can also do things like um, use vigorous hydration. Again, the faster you can flush that through the kidneys, the better off you're going to be from trying to save some of those cells there. Um, and again, the best thing you can do if it, the injury does occur is just treat them supportively. You know, if you, rarely do patients need dialysis from this, but you do want to make sure that you're replacing electrolytes as needed. So you have to monitor the BMP pretty frequently, um, and then you'll give them extra magnesium, give them extra potassium if need be, right? The other thing is, is uh, you know, what are the treatment times for like a fungal infection versus like say a bacterial infection? Longer, shorter? Longer. Typically longer, right? The fungus is typically have a harder time to treat that, so they're going to be on this longer period of time anyway. So again, this is going to be kind of a, the natural detriment to, to these type of infections. Okay. Uh, other things you can run into. So this is more on the, the post renal side, the actual intertubular obstruction. Again, this is where you're going to find um, that uh, the drugs will be crystallizing out, causing an impediment to that urine flow. Again, that can also have kind of a superimposed acute tubular necrosis. So again, when you have those drugs crystallizing out in the actual tubules, you can see some damage, but you can also find that obstruction occurred maybe anywhere down uh, in the collecting system, right? So again, methotrexate, things like uh, acyclovir, et cetera. And again, what's the best way to prevent that from occurring, that precipitation? Hydration, right? It always goes back to hydration. Keep them vigorously hydrated. Typically, you're going to find that to be less of an issue. Not always possible, depending on the patient, but that's generally what we'll be looking for. And again, um, this can be not only just the drugs themselves precipitating out, but something we're doing to the patient to cause this or some of the drugs are doing to cause this. And I mentioned tumor lysis syndrome is a big one. We have all that uric acid being leached out of those cancer cells causing precipitation of uric acid. Um, oftentimes we can either hydrate the patient or we can actually give them allopurinol. If you remember back to where, where do we use allopurinol? Gout, what did it do? And they give it a class or a mechanism. The xanthine oxidase inhibitor. And what does xanthine oxidase do? actually produces uric acid, right? So again, when you have the breakdown of those purines, they eventually turn into uh, uric acid. So if I can get something that prevents you from actually getting to that final product, that can be useful, right? There's that, or if I've already produced all the uric acid, remember there's a drug called rasbiracase that we can give. It's very, very expensive. We don't use it very often, but that can actually directly cleave and break down the uric acid to make it more water soluble and you just pee it right out. Um, but again, most of those patients will end up getting uh, allopurinol. So if you ever see like a cancer patient on allopurinol, it's probably not because of gout, it's probably because of the tumor lysis syndrome you're worried about in those patients, right? Um, rhabdomyolysis, right? So we mentioned what class of drugs is most commonly thought of to cause rhabdomyolysis or in your mind. Statins are a big one, right? But you can also see this with malignant hyperthermia, right? We mentioned what kind of drugs cause that? So that's on choline and your inhaled anesthetics, right? So again, not nitrous oxide, but certainly sevoflurane, um, halothane, influrane, any of those, desflurane, any of those can cause malignant hyperthermia, right? And so those patients with that genetic predisposition, right? They have that mutation in that right and dying receptor. And so um, again, that all that myoglobin breaking down from the muscles being overactivated can lead to precipitation of that in the renal tubules and you get the same problem, right? Um, what else do you think could cause that rhabdomyolysis? Maybe like certain psych meds, anything there? Antipsychotics causing, what was like the major, like really scary outcome from using antipsychotics? Like those high potency D2 blockers? 
not the tardive dyskinesia. That's something more of a long-term sort of complication. Remember that hmm? yeah. NMS, yeah, yeah. So NMS. So again, the NMS is kind of the the way worse version of EPS, so to speak. So that neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Remember that I talked about that lip hyperrigidity. Those muscles get overstrained and they start to break down, right? Um, rarely you would see this with serotonin syndrome. Sometimes you see some amphetamine. So lots of different reasons why they shouldn't develop rhabdo, right? Um, but again, the treatment's going to be the same regardless. You're going to be hydrating them vigorously, try to keep it from precipitating out. In some cases, you may try to alkalize the urine. But again, hydration is always going to be your better bet in, in that case. You get more bang for your buck in that case there. Okay. So... So we've kind of talked about these, um, but again, the biggest thing to look at why you get these drug precipitations occurring is usually low urine volumes, low drug solubility, or volume depletion. All of that can be fixed with usually giving more volume, or if you need to, perhaps alkalizing the urine. Never are we going to try to acidify the urine. That's just not something we typically do, um, but just to kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So one of the last things I want to talk about here is going to be disorders of sodium homeostasis. There's a few new drugs we're going to talk about here. Um, they're important, but I also think it's a really good idea to know how to use sodium chloride effectively for your patients because um, it is something that you're going to find to be pretty ubiquitous in medicine and you're going to think, oh, it's pretty safe stuff. But in fact, sodium chloride can be pretty dangerous, right? Anything in a big enough dose can be poisonous. And this is one of those things too where you have to be really careful um, in using sodium uh, effectively, right? So anyway, so looking at your total body water. What is that made up of? You have your ECF and your ICF, right? So the intracellular fluid and your extracellular fluid. What is making up the extracellular fluid? Basically anything outside of the cells, right? So you're going to find like your interstitial fluid and also what's in the actual blood vessels themselves, right? Your actual blood volume is going to be included in the extracellular fluid, okay? And again, to get to the ICF, you have to go from the blood volume to the interstitium into the actual cells themselves, right? It's the general flow of things. And again, why do we, what, what maintains that equilibrium between the ECF and the ICF? Well, some of it's due to oncotic pressure, right? What provides, what provides oncotic pressure? Proteins, right? Things like albumin is one of the major contributors there, right? So that's what helps us keep our blood volume up, right? Because we know if we have low albumin levels, where does that fluid go to? leaches out, right? It leaches out into the interstitium and into the intracellular compartment, right? But again, what's the big thing that maintains equilibrium between ICF and ECF? It's the osmolarity between the two, right? So again, you're going to find that if I'm hyperosmolar in the ECF and hypoosmolar in the ICF, where's that fluid going to go to? It's going to go to the ECF, right? Fluid follows the solutes. It's going to go to where it's more concentrated to try to get that new equilibrium there. And so that's important to remember. So if I have a patient who has, uh, say, for instance, a, a depletion of the ICF, say chronically they're dehydrated, they've been vomiting, they've been having diarrhea, and they're kind of just depleted in the ICF, I know that's going to be more concentrated. The osmolarity is going up. Well, what can I do in the ECF to try to balance that out? Well, I can give them more volume. I can try to give them more free water to try to balance that out. And that's where I can use something like a hypoosmolar solution in order for that to transfer over. Now, when you think of isotonic fluids, what do you think of? Normal saline, think of lactated ringers, right? And again, what is normal saline with concentration? 0.9%, right? How many milliequivalents of sodium is that per liter? 154, it's good numbers to remember coming up here, okay? So again, if I needed to try to replete that intracellular fluid, I could try something like a hypoosmolar sodium chloride solution, and what is that? Half normal saline, which is 0.45%. I can sometimes use quarter normal saline, which is 0.22%. There's a lot of varieties here, right? So we're going to talk about how we can shift things around if need be. Now, again, there's some cases where I want to shift fluid out of the intracellular space, right? What are some cases where that would be useful? Or maybe certain compartments where fluid is starting to build up and I'm starting to swelling. I want to pull that off. What can I do there? Yeah, so we, we're going to talk about hypertonic saline. We're talking about things that are hypertonic to try to pull fluid off of certain compartments. So specifically, if you get into something like a trauma case, right? So someone bashes their head after a car wreck, the brain starts to swell up with fluid. Well, how do I get that fluid off of there? I just like drill in there and just let it pop, you know, kind of flow out? Tap like a maple tree? No, you do not do that. No, what you can do, though, is give hypertonic fluid to dry, try to drive that fluid out of the compartment and back into the blood volume. And then where does it go? pee right out, right? So again, these are things we do very commonly, especially depending on if you're working like on a neurosurge unit, if you're working with trauma, um, you know, anyone, you're going to see these disorders that are going to pop up here. And it's important to know how you're using your fluids effectively um, to make sure that things are working well, right? And again, all this balance is being maintained with that sodium potassium pump. It's another very critical component. I'm not going to belabor that because we've gone over it a million times already, right?
And remember the sodium potassium pump? Potassium goes which direction? In the cell or out of the cell? In the cell, right? Remember, this is against the concentration gradient. Sodium goes out of the cell against the concentration gradient, right? What's your normal sodium level? 140 mL equivalents per liter, right? 135 to 145, right? So again, that's more sodium on the outside of the cell. Remember the salt rat banana phenomenon we talked about, the analogy? It all goes back to this stuff, okay? So anyway, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, when you give an isotonic fluid, something like 0.9% sodium chloride, the osm osmolarity between the intracellular and the uh, extracellular fluid should be, uh, should be the same. In that case, there should be no net fluid shift, right? I'm just adding extra volume into the extracellular compartment, right? So when I use 0.9% sodium chloride, if I give and one extra liter into the vasculature, that liter most likely is gonna stay in that vasculature, right? Which is good if I have someone who's volume depleted. I can replace that, right? And get their blood pressure back up. If I'm using hypertonic solutions, and again, when you say hypertonic saline, what does that mean? Like what kind of concentrations would you think of? 3% is a good one, what else? Occasionally 5%, not super common. 7%, sometimes you, you'll sometimes see that for respiratory uh, treatments, right? Because they use it as a mucolytic. We talked about that in CF a little bit. 23.4% um, potentially, right? And I'll talk about the concentrations as in a little bit. But yeah, anything greater than 0.9 is considered hypertonic, okay? Anything that's hypotonic is going to be less than 0.9%. That's your half normal, quarter normal salines. Just plain D5 or just plain dextrose, that's going to be hypotonic as well. And I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, but again, if I give hypertonic solutions, I should see decreases in the intracellular fluid and see increases in the ECF because I'm drawing fluid out of that compartment. And if I were to give the opposite of hypotonic fluid, I should draw fluid into the ICF. Okay. Everyone with me so far? This goes right back to your renal stuff, right? With Dr. O, hopefully. You haven't dropped all of that already? Fantastic. So looking at this graph, um, this is good to get a good comparison between the different types of fluids that we have here. So one of the things you're going to notice, um, or one, we talked about the tonicity of it, we talked about the sodium content of it, um, and we are talking about where the fluid is going to ultimately end up, whether it's going to mostly in, stay in the ECF when I give it intravenously, or is it going to go more to the intracellular space, right, the ICF. So we'll talk about those percentages there in a second. The exact numbers aren't important to remember, but again, the trends are what we're looking for, right? The kind of the broad concepts here. And then we'll talk about this concept of free water. What you're gonna notice is the more free water you're administering, the more likely it is to partition into the intracellular space, as we're gonna say here, okay? So anyway, so looking at something like normal saline, you see it's 154 milligrams per liter of sodium, 154 of chloride, isotonic to the blood, 100% of that should stay in the extracellular space when you administer it, which means if I am, uh, say I have a, a blood volume depletion and I need to replace that, if I give a liter of normal saline, it's going to stay right there for the most part, okay? There's some other competing factors that can affect that, but let's just say, for instance, that's what's going on. Um, notice here, no free water, which means none of that extra water is going to be transitioning into the intracellular space. I should see no net shift of fluids there. Wherever I put the extra liter of water, that's going to be staying there, okay? Some of the lactated ringers is also going to be considered isotonic. You're going to see that roughly no net fluid shift should be happening here as well. Okay. Notice here it's like 130 of sodium. So you just say, well, it doesn't look, really look isotonic, but what else is in lactated ringers besides just sodium and chloride? Some potassium, some magnesium, probably a little bit of calcium, some lactate. There's other things providing that oncotic or the osmotic pressure, I should say, not oncotic, right? 3% um, normal saline or 3% uh, sodium chloride there, you see 513, right? So you much more concentrated for in terms of sodium goes, right? So again, what electrolyte imbalance could I cause there? Hypernatremia, right? You'd expect to see if I were to give too much of that. That's hypertonic. You should see a negative value in that free water, right? You're drawing water off of the intracellular space, which is good if I have someone who has maybe at risk for, say, uh, you know, brainstem herniation because their head's swelling because they hit their head in a car wreck, right? I can draw a fluid off of there, okay? It'd be very, very useful. And so, again, we consider the negative free water because we're drawing fluid out of the intracellular space back into the extracellular. Conversely, if we're looking at something like just dextrose 5%, if you notice, we consider it hypotonic, even though if you were to actually measure the osmolarity of D5, it actually ends up being pretty close to um, 300. So why do we consider it to be hypotonic, though? Exactly. So we either break it down, the, the dextrose, or we take it up into the cells. It, you get rid of it very quickly. So because of that, it turns into just plain water at that point. So we consider that to be a liter of free water. A majority of that's going to go into intracellular space. So that would not be good for volume repletion if you had someone who is, say, hypotensive due to dehydration, right? Versus my normal saline is perfect for that because I know once I put it into the veins, it's going to stay right there, right in the vasculature. Okay. 
And then you good concepts to remember going forward. So how do we regulate sodium in the body? Aldosterone is a big player. What else? Hmm? Yeah, the kidneys are going to be the main things are going to be regulating that, right? What other hormones are really important there as well? If you remember talking about, like, say you have like too much like uh, uh, too much volume, sort of stretch out certain parts of the heart. You know, remember atrial natriuretic peptide, right? Natriuretic means you're going to be peeing out <coughs> sodium, right? Um, so, right, those are all going to be playing a role here. The main things I'm going to be focusing on are going to be um, are going to be aldosterone in terms of sodium regulation, and then what's the other big thing that helps to regulate water balance in the kidneys? ADH, right? What's another name for ADH? Vasopressin, right? DDAVP, if you ever see that, that means arginine vasopressin, right? Um, so those are all going to be playing a role in terms of water uh, handling, right? And we're going to get into that. We're going to talk a little bit about SIDH. We're going to talk about diabetes insipidus a little bit. We're going to talk about all these things and how they're playing a role with both water and sodium regulation here, okay? And again, the biggest thing here is that the kidneys are going to regulate how well tightly controlled the sodium is. And again, if you get low sodium levels, it's going to be able to activate responses to try to get sodium back up. And again, it's all these hypothalamic feedback responses, right? So for instance, if my sodium concentration is too high, the kidneys are detecting, hey, there's too much sodium here. What does your body release to combat that? Well, it's going to be ADH, right? Because it says, well, I got too much sodium. It's too concentrated. I need more fluid here. So it's going to say, well, let's increase release of ADH. ADH stimulates what? Aquaporin expression, right, in the, in the collecting ducts, right? So I get more water reabsorption. What else does it stimulate? We don't have any water here. You get a little thirsty, right? You get thirsty, right? That thirst response kicks in, right? So you end up in taking actual free water, right? And again, if you ever have a patient who has SIADH or that syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, they are the thirstiest people on the planet. And it is they will sell their grandma up the river in order to get some water. They are so thirsty. It is incredible to see how their brain is reacting, how it actually influences their behaviors when they have this increased release of this hormone, right? It's, it's, I mean, they will bribe, cheat, and steal nurses to get them some Gatorade from the cafeteria, even though they're on water and salt restrictions. Like, they will do a lot to try to get some fluid there. And it's very interesting to see that, that response. That's one of the critical components there, right? So anyway, so again, um, also note as well that osmolality in the blood is not only just maintained by sodium, but also um, by glucose, and also BUN is, play, is playing a role there, right? So again, glucose, and again, you're going to find you have patients who have um, very high levels of glucose. Like you remember that um, we talked about the hyperosmotic, hyper or non-ketotic um, syndrome in type two diabetic patients. It's kind of like a, a kind of a similar thing as DKA, but they don't really get acidotic. They get very very high glucose levels, and that can actually throw off their osmolarity pretty pretty drastically there. B1 as well. So if you had someone who had say azotemia due to poor kidney function, that can affect their osmolality as well. So anyway, so we mentioned arginine vasopressin or AVP, ADH, you know, all, all names are the same thing. Um, you're going to find this gets released from the pituitary. It will uh, stimulate that thirst response and stimulate aquaporin expression in the kidney. So that way you're going to be reabsorbing more water. Does it have any direct effect on sodium? Not directly, right? So again, when you're intaking fluids, though, in that thirst response, and then you may be getting something with electrolytes in it, so it may cause some increased sodium intake. And in the kidneys, it doesn't really do it. It'll have great effects on sodium, but again, it's not a direct measure, right? Again, it's directly affecting water, not necessarily the sodium uh, directly there, okay? So anyway, and again, you're also going to see this get stimulated by the angiotensin aldosterone system. And again, we're going to talk about aldosterone in just a few minutes here as well, okay? And again, the big thing here is going to try to um, increase volume because normally it's detecting either there's too much sodium, the osmolarity is too high, things are too concentrated, and there's not enough volume, okay? So that's when that's going to be uh, directly stimulated. Okay, so when you're assessing a patient, and again, if I can get to the right slide, here, when you're assessing a patient for hyponatremia, there's several things that go into it. I'm going to talk about some of the more common causes um, here, uh, but again, when you're assessing a patient for hyponatremia, what are some things you're going to be looking at? What kind of lab values do you want to look at? So sodium, yes, okay, great. So you're going to measure sodium. Perfect. Where do you get your sodium from? Your basic metabolic panel, right? So that's a lab you would order there, right? What else could you order? A UA is good, right? So that's going to tell me how much sodium is in the urine. It's going to tell me what the specific gravity of the urine is. It's going to tell me the osmolarity of the urine. That's good. What else? What do I order? Hmm? Yeah, potassium uh, could be playing a role. Maybe not so much here, but you know, certainly they'll be on your BMP anyway, so you'd have that. How about measuring the actual osmolality of the blood? You can actually get a measured osmolality. In fact, this is something I do all the time. Have you ever, guys ever heard of the osmolar gap? What is that? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so it's a measured osmolality versus what I calculate based off of the patient's sodium, glucose, and BUN. <laughs> Sometimes that comes in handy for me as a toxicologist because if I have someone who uh, ingests something that will increase the osmolarity, I see a gap develop. I know there's something else floating around that blood that shouldn't be there, and I get to find out what it is. Frequently, that turns into like things like radiator fluid or windshield washer fluid, what we call the toxic alcohols. And going along with that, ethanol itself will actually increase your osmolar gap as well. So that's oftentimes something else we'll measure when we're looking at osmolarity and getting osmolar gap, we'll measure uh, alcohol levels as well. Because again, depressed people, when they try to commit suicide, what do what they commonly co-ingest? Alcohol, right? Very frequently they'll do that. Or like alcoholic patients to run out of their alcohol and they switch over to something else, usually that radiator fluid, something like that. But anyway, uh, we'll talk about that in another day. So basically what you're finding is that you want to measure the serum osmolality. You're going to find, and again, I'm going to probably mix up osmolality and osmolarity. I knew it at one point what the difference truly is, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. We're going to use them interchangeably, right? If you want to write that in my review, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. <laughs> That's fine, right? But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, getting into it, though, we can see that we have things like, you know, normal osmolality versus we can have hypo or hyper osmolality, and they can be caused by different things, right? So for instance, if I have someone who has a hyper osmolar Sort of situation, right? So I measure the osmolarity and it's like 340, 360 or something like that. But my patient's hyponatremic, well, there's probably something else there that's causing that sodium to be diluted out. And I can look at that and say sometimes it's hyperglycemia, right? So you mentioned those type 2 patients that come in with, you know, glucose levels 6, 7, 800, right? You can see big shifts there. Um, more often than not, they're going to run into patients who have a low serum osmolality who are hyponatremic at the same time. And so this is when you can break it down into um, several different varieties, right? We're going to talk about hypovolemic hyponatremia, hypervolemic hypernatremia, and then euvolemic hypernatremia, hyponatremia, I should say. Have you guys covered this with Dr. O yet? Good, so this will all be review. I want to focus on the, on the medications, though, right? So the things that either can cause this or things that could be potentially uh, used to treat some of these conditions here, right? And again, how we're going to use sodium chloride specifically in order to manage a lot of these. So when you have a hypertonic hyponatremia, usually this is going to occur when you have excess. Again, should I go to the next slide? If I forget something, just remind me, just throw a shoe at me or something. Um, when you have hypertonic hyponatremia, it's usually due to extra solutes that are in the blood there that are getting uh, kind of thrown your measurement off there a little bit. This is frequently seen with hyperglycemia. And in fact, just a little handy tool there, for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose above what the normal is, for those patients who come in with like a glucose of 7, 800, um, they basically just want to drop your serum sodium by 1.7 milliequivalents per liter. So oftentimes it'll look really drastically hyponatremic, but when you do the correction there, you can actually find they're probably a little bit closer to normal. It's just that all the extra glucose is just thrown off your, your measurements there on your, on your uh, test. Um, and again, remember when you have so much extra osmolality in the blood there, that's hypertonic now to the ICF, what is it going to cause fluid to do? It's going to shift from the ICF into the ECF, right? Because it wants to balance out all of that, right? All those extra solutes. So when you do that, that's when you end up seeing that shift. Again, that's when you see a dilutional effect on that sodium. That's why you get hyponatremic due to that. All the extra fluids trying to migrate out of the ICF to the ECF, and it ends up diluting out your sodium a little bit. So that's when you end up seeing that. Now, other cases where you might see this, if I were to give hyperosmolar agents like mannitol, mannitol has a lot of osmolality to it. That's going to increase, um, it's going to affect your sodium. Um, you know, I mentioned the toxic alcohols, things like um, propylene glycol, diethylene glycol, all those things that can cause that as well. Now, the most common thing you're going to run into is going to be this hypotonic hyponatremia. And again, this has the most number of causes here. And so um, when you see a hypotonic hyponatremia, the first thing you have to figure out is their volume status, right? So you want to figure out if they're hypovolemic, so too little fluid, if they're euvolemic, so just the right amount of fluid, kind of the Goldilocks amount of fluid, or they're hypervolemic, they too much fluid, okay? So we're going to talk about the common causes here. Again, this is where most of our medications are going to be coming into play, right? Now, again, what's the most common one, cause of euvolemic hyponatremia? Anyone know? It's IDH, right? And that's where most of our drugs can, if we can see like a drug-induced hyponatremia, this is where most often we're going to end up seeing that uh, playing a role. We'll, we'll find some other examples as well. So look at starting off with hypovolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia, right? So again, the patient does not have enough volume here, and they also have a lack of sodium, okay? Generally, this is going to be due to excess of fluid loss, right? So either they're having diarrhea, they're vomiting, perhaps they're abusing things like diuretics, right? Too much diuretic, obviously you're going to lose fluid. You're also going to be losing salt along with that. That makes sense. You would have a hypovolemic hyponatremia, right? You're kind of losing both of those in equal cases there. Now, what does the body do when it, does, when it detects we have too little volume? Well, it stimulates AVP release, right? Arginine vasopressin. It's going to be releasing an antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic means less urine, right? So you're going to cause the increase in water 
be reabsorbed, but does that have any direct effect on the sodium? No, so what you're gonna find is that you find an even more dilutional effect. Now, aldosterone is also gonna be activated here as well as part of that RAS system. So again, that will have some good effects on sodium, try to get that back up. But again, because of the um, concentrating effects of the urine that AVP has, you're gonna find you dilute out your sodium even further. So again, that's why you get this hypovolemic hyponatremia, right? And on top of that, when you stimulate that thirst response, you're gonna be drinking water, right? Then whenever I like, wake up in the middle of the night and like get like a big glass of cold water and like the best water you've ever had in your entire life. Again, that's probably that antidiuretic hormone that you're starting to secrete a little bit there saying you're dehydrated, right? Um, but again, usually that's just free water you're intaking. And again, no extra solutes there. So again, that's gonna also have a dilutional effect on that sodium. So several kind of factors playing a role here. Um, and again, you're gonna find this can either be minor, it could have a minor sort of hyponatremia where it's asymptomatic or it can become more severe depending on the cases here, okay? I guess you find that um, most commonly you're going to find is with thiazide diuretics, although most times it's going to be asymptomatic, right? So we might find a very mild hyponatremia, you know, say 135 is my lower end of normal, maybe I'll say 134, 133. Patients aren't really going to get symptomatic from that specifically, okay? Getting into the uvolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, right? So that's just the right amount of fluid. This is usually going to be due to something like SIADH. Now, if you remember, what kind of drugs can cause this? One of the most common ones we talked about. Like some of your patients like bipolar disorder or seizures, carbamazepine, oscarbazepine, even for, even more than that, right? So those are the big ones you're going to think about there. Um, certainly a lot of CNS disorders. So if you have like a tumor or you have meningitis or you have a head trauma or something like that, I see a lot of patients either post neurosurgery or say they had a head trauma or they have cerebral swelling. I oftentimes will see SIDH uh, happen there. And in fact, um, working when I was doing a rotation in the surgical ICU, which is dealing with all these neurosurge patients, uh, doing all these trauma patients. This is the, probably the most common thing we are dealing with in the post-operative period is dealing with the SIDH and the complications on their sodium. It's so, so common. Most of our patients are having issues with this. But other things, you know, pulmonary disease can affect this. Um, and also you can have a primary slash psychogenic sort of polydipsia. And again, that's where you're going to have patients who are ingesting a ton and ton of water pretty chronically. And again, they'll be euvolemic because when you have too much volume, what does your brain do? just shut down ADH release, right? So you're gonna be able to get rid of that extra fluid, but you may not be able to get rid of that extra sodium. So you may find um, you have a, a dilutional effect there where the volume may be somewhat normal, but the sodium is gonna be diluted out. It's gonna have a hyponatremia, right? So again, that's less common. SIDH is probably gonna be the most common one you're gonna run into, okay? Um, as I mentioned with drug-induced uh, SIDH, there's several varieties here, kind of different flavors. One could be that you're having increased antidiuretic hormone release. So some things that can cause this include, uh, and again, some of these are going to have varying degrees of, of commonality, how often they're going to happen. Um, things like nicotine can cause this, tricyclic antidepressants, the vinca alkaloids. Anyone remember where we saw those? Yeah, for cancer treatment, right? So again, those are good um, uh, antimitotic drugs. Uh, we can have sometimes have an increased sensitivity to ADH, so things like carbamazepine, lamotrigine, NSAIDs can cause this. And then sometimes I'll have kind of a mixed sort of action there. Um, things like ACE inhibitors, SSRIs, and then interestingly enough, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, otherwise known as MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy, otherwise known as Molly, if you ever hear that, right? Somebody that answered that too quick. Again, your drug screens will be waiting outside. <laughs> Just kidding. This is probably a very, it's kind of a very interesting one. MDMA tends to cause a little bit more hyponatremia. It's kind of very interesting why that happens. Some of it due to the SIADH, some of it actually due to this kind of psychogenic polydipsia, right? So again, I find patients that abuse amphetamines, they tend to partake of these kind of repetitive sort of actions, right? So that's why a lot of them get that teeth grinding, that bruxism that happens there. Um, some of them will drink a ton, a ton of water and that ends up causing very severe hyponatremia. I've seen one patient actually die from that, coming in with the sodium, like in the 110s, um, actively seizing, and it was secondary to um, ecstasy use, a very, very sad case. But again, you can find that there's a little bit of different actions there, whether it's due to more ADH in the system or maybe your body's just more sensitive to it. Okay, and then with the hypervolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia, so now you have too much volume, and you have a hyponatremia going on here. This is usually where the kidney's uh, ability to excrete sodium and water are going to be impaired here. Um, so typically, you're going to have this expanded ECF. You're going to find edema. Patients are going to be edematous. Um, however, you're going to find that due to several issues, you might have this decreased effective arterial blood volume, right? So again, pressure might not be high, but it could be leaking out a lot of these fluids. You get very edematous in those cases there. And this is where you see things like CHF, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. This is where oftentimes that can be playing a role, uh, your oncotic pressure, right? So maybe your lack of albumin is causing you not to be able to hold on to as much fluid in the intravascular space. And so that effective volume is going to be low. All that fluid is going to be pulling out in the ECF on the outside of the vasculature. And that's where you can kind of run into that. 
Okay, so again, one of the big things you're going to find is that when you're assessing for hyponatremia, you have to determine kind of the degree of the chronicity of it, right? So the faster the changes occurred, you're going to find that there's not a whole lot of cerebral adaptation that has occurred, okay? What I mean by that is that the sodium levels on the inside of the CNS, right, past that blood-brain barrier, have not had time to re-equilibrate, right? And that takes time to occur, 24, 48 hours potentially. Um, so when that changes happen very rapidly, you're going to find that the brain really hasn't time to adapt. Typically, when you have that occur, you can correct that sodium much more quickly. So the case I always think about in my mind is when I was in uh, on, actually I was in school, I was on rotations, and I found this lady that was in, um, I was rotating at, at uh, out of the beaches, and we we're in this ICU, and this lady, uh, she's probably like in her mid-40s, and she decided, I'm going to get in shape. It's the dead of summer. It's the middle of July. I'm going to get in shape. Now's the time. She never worked out a day in her life. I said, I'm going to do a boot camp out of the beach. You go to this boot camp. It's so hot. Do you think she gets enough fluid? No. So she's sweating profusely, not getting enough fluid in. So she comes in. She develops a seizure out there, mainly due to the fact that she had lost a lot of sodium, not a lot of fluid on her. And so she had a very rapid change in her serum sodium. They were able to correct very quickly, right? Because there wasn't a lot of adaptation that occurred within the space of a few hours versus something that's more chronic, meaning greater than 48 hours. At that point, you've had enough time to equilibrate the sodium levels between your brain to the rest of the body. That's going to become important when I talk about correction, because if you covered what the major complication of correcting sodium too quickly is, central pontine myelinolysis, I'm a hard word to say, um, osmotic demyelination syndrome, is that a bad thing? Yes, you don't want to cause that because if you do, you're probably going to get sued for that because it's a very known complication because it's something that's very easy to screw up. And I've seen many, many people screw it up before not really calculating your sodium effectively, how quickly to, to calculate it or how to, how to correct it. Anyway, so again, when your symptoms, hey, sir. I'm just curious, like a younger, healthy population, I mean, isotonic fluid, is it you have to be cautious with it when you give your IVs? So if you have someone, and we'll talk, kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of the, the fluids here in just a few minutes, but um, typically what you're going to find is, is that um, patients who have, say, normal healthy individual, maybe they have some vomiting, diarrhea, they're, hypone or they're, they're volume depleted, you can give them normal saline, not going to run into big problems, right? Normal saline is probably going to be the safest thing you can administer because it's closest to what our normal serum sodium is, right? We said 154 is a little hyper in treatment compared to what we normally are, but however, with half normal saline, what's the concentration of sodium there? 77. And so again, that's very hypo natrium compared to what our blood is. And so you're going to find that typically NS is going to be the safest thing to give. That's when you're going to get least likely to get into trouble with. Okay. In general, but we'll get into details on that in just a minute here. But um, regardless of the, the you know, you can have mild cases of hyponatremia where you just kind of have some nausea, malaise. When you get some more moderate, you know, say 115 to 124, you know, you get headache, lethargy, disorientation. It's a lot of neuro symptoms you're going to find here. And then find the more severe cases are where you have the seizures, the conia, uh, the conia, the coma, uh, brainstem herniation. Now, why do you think you get brainstem herniation from hyponatremia? Yeah, why would, why would a severe case of hyponatremia cause brainstem herniation? Well, makes sense if you think about where the fluid's shifting to, right? So again, if you have this hypotonic blood, the serum now, it only has a sodium of 110 versus the sodium in the brain is still sitting at 135 potentially, right? 140, where's that fluid gonna go to? It's gonna shift into the CNS. Now again, most of us have pretty hard heads, right? Not a whole lot of flex gonna happen there. So that means that pressure builds up and then where's the only way, the only, only space for your brain to go? Down and out, right? So that's where you get that brainstem herniation that occurs from that. And again, that's why you can see that with um, uh, cases of hyponatremia because you're causing a shift of fluid into the CNS. That's what causes that pressure to build up, okay? And again, that's frequently what we're trying to stop and what we're trying to prevent when we're giving things a hypertonic saline. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So as I mentioned, laboratory tests, you're measuring your serum sodium, you're measuring your plasma and urine osmolality there. Um, again, looking at how concentrated the sodium and the osmolality is in the urine can give you an idea of how well this kidney is concentrating things or not concentrating as the case may be. Other things you're going to look at, serum glucose, you know, their lipids, their kidneys, et cetera, are, are all going to be able to give you a good idea of kind of what's going on more holistically with the patient there, right? And again, um, that cerebral edema typically you're going to find that the the speed and the change of the sodium, how uh, how big of a change and how fast that occurs, um, is going to affect how much that cerebral edema can happen there. And as I mentioned, it takes the brain about 48 hours to compensate maximally. Once you have that compensation occurs, you need to be much more careful about correcting that sodium too quickly because when you overcorrect too quickly, you're going to find that uh, demyelination syndrome can happen there. Okay. 
Okay. So as I mentioned, um, when you have overcorrections, so now all of a sudden, say for instance, you know your serum sodium was at say 115 for several days, and your your brain uh, uh, sodium is now 115 as well. You've had time to equilibrate. Now all of a sudden, if I correct that and I get you back up to say 135, 140 in the blood, where's all that fluid going to go to? Out of the brain, rush back out into the into the extracellular fluid, right, the vasculature. When that occurs, all your cells are starting to shrink. Remember the term you talked about, the cell shrinkage crenation that happens there, right? All your cells are going to start to contract. And when that happens, that's when you find that demyelination syndrome that occurs, right? So we get that quadriparesis, uh, paralysis, death occurs uh, when you see that. And so again, to be very, very careful. So when you have someone who has a quick change in sodium, you can fix that no problem because there's no adaptation that occurs in the brain. When you have someone who's had long-standing chronic hyponatremia, those are the ones you want to be careful about switching, right? So again, especially when I think about like patients in the nursing home, maybe don't get a whole lot of, um, don't get a whole lot of care day to day. I'm not really watching them very closely. Those are the patients who have had time to equilibrate and those you got to be careful with. Okay. So um, generally, first thing you want to do in managing these patients is get the underlying cause of hyponatremia fixed first, obviously, and then kind of measuring the balance between um, the hyponatremia, where, what's going on with the patient as far as that goes, versus the risk for that osmotic demyelination syndrome, right? So again, you're kind of balancing the two. So my patient's actively seizing that's probably a more immediate concern than if uh, than that ODS, right? That that osmotic demyelination syndrome. So very frequently, you're trying to balance those those two concerns out there. And so um, the best thing you can do in general is just to use normal saline, right? Normal saline is going to be the least likely to give you any really problems in those cases. There, typically, if they're hypovolemic, any volume, just give normal saline. You're going to get plenty of volume along with that. That's going to be relatively safe to administer there. Okay. Things get more complicated though when you have euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia. Because then at that point, well, they have enough volume, or in fact, they might have too much volume. Giving them a normal saline might be too much extra volume. It could be worsening their edema. It could worsen cardiac function of that CHF. It could have several deleterious consequences there. So that's when you run into um, uses for things like water restriction. So around things like demeclocycline. It's a new drug we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, AVP receptor antagonists and or using normal saline with, along with the loop diuretic. We think the benefit of using normal saline along with the loop diuretic. Yeah, you're going to end up keeping more sodium and get rid of some of the extra water than you are getting rid of the blood. Because, again, they don't go out in equal, equal amounts in those cases there. Um, so in some cases, you might find the two used together, and we'll see. Again, concentrated sodium chloride, you have to be super, super careful with this stuff. Anything greater than 0.9% needs to be treated as a weapon almost, right? Because you can really harm some of this stuff. And those are going to be used more to manage more severe cases of hyponatremia. So the patients are actively seizing. Those are the ones you're going to see get 3% uh, saline, right? 23.4 percent right those are the ones you gotta be careful with so uh, as i mentioned for acute or severely symptomatic hyponatremia uh, patients this is where we're going to be managing out with three percent sodium chloride again look at the concentration here 513 milliequivalents per liter versus the 154 we're normally dealing with with normal saline right um in fact some institutions in fact that surgical icu i mentioned i rotated in they were really cavalier they're using the 23.4 percent extra danger but as long as you're using the right kind of volumes the doses are the same, right? You're going to find that as long as you're using the right volumes, um, they can be used effectively there. But basically what you're going to find is that for most patients who are more severely symptomatic, you need to get them probably about a 5% increase in their sodium. Again, getting them up to about a target of 120 generally is going to be sufficient, right? They still may be somewhat symptomatic, but they're not really going to be in that seizure sort of range. That's going to generally be uh, safe for them. And I'll talk about the max you want to be correcting them in, in a 24-hour period. Does anyone know what that is by any chance? We'll talk about what that is. That's a good and important number to remember. But, um, and again, you have to compare the urinary sodium versus the corrective fluid here. When I say that, that means is that you can actually worsen hyponatremia by giving normal saline in cases of something like SIDH. And like, well, how in the heck is that going to happen there, right? Why in the world would that occur? But it kind of makes sense, right? When you think about some of the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, their issue is not with sodium management, their issue is with water management, okay? So if someone with too much antidiuretic hormone, they're still going to hold on to that water. But if I'm giving normal saline, they're just going to end up peeing it all out, all right? Even though the because that urine is going to be very very concentrated due to that extra ADH that's there. And so because of that, it can actually worsen things. So we'll talk about some management for SIDH later. But again, just be careful when using your uh, normal saline. In some cases, it will make things worse. As I mentioned, loop diuretics, things like my loops, furosemide. Is that the only one? The only one you got, you got Lasix and that's it. 
you got torsamide, you got bimetanide, you got epicrinic acid, right? We have several loop diuretics you can use in these cases, right? Um, they can be used to help manage that volume overload, right? So again, you may be giving extra volume, but if they can't really handle it, that's where you use a loop diuretic as well to get rid of some of the extra water. You're still gonna preferentially hold on to most of that sodium, but some of that water is gonna be get, gotten rid of as well. <laughs>
This is one of those things, right? Because you got to make sure you're not going to give them too much <coughs> sodium to try to overcorrect them, and that's going to be a problem, right? So again, this, these are calculations you might be doing in the ER, the ICU, anywhere to try to figure out what the difference is going to be here. So let's say we have a 66-year-old woman. She's presenting to the ER. She has vertigo. She has disorientation. And she started <coughs> carbamazepine 10 days ago, say for bipolar disorder, right? We know carbamazepine causes what? SIDH, right? So what would you assume she has? She has hyponatremia, but is it hypovolemic, hyper, euvolemic? Usually euvolemic, right? Not mevolemic, but euvolemic, right? And so we go ahead and check a BMP. Maybe we do uh, ABG, something like that. We get her serum sodium back, and it's 108 milligrams per liter. Is that low? That sounds pretty low to me, right? 135 to 145 is considered normal. So uh, first thing, what are you going to do for that patient? probably not going to give her any more carbamazepine, right? So again, you discontinue the drug right there because she has severe hyponatremia. And so the question is, well, how much should we correct this patient? She's already at 108. So what do we need to correct her to? We said that the rule is no more than 12 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours. So 12 plus 108 is what? 120, right? So our goal is to get her to a goal of 120 milliequivalents per liter, okay? That's what we're shooting for. So we need to figure out how much volume of sodium chloride we need to administer to get her to that 120. So we figure out how much she's going to get in a 24-hour period, and then we just divide that up by 24 hours, and you figure out how much volume she's going to need per hour, okay? That's basically what we're trying to get at here, figure out how much sodium chloride we need to administer. So getting into that, let's say, okay, well, let's say we want to administer 3% sodium chloride. Again, this is more concentrated, so you think the total volume you're going to need as compared to normal saline is less or more? More concentrated, so probably need less of it to, in order to get the same change, right? And I'll show you the, what the calculation looks like when you use normal saline here as, as a comparison. So let's say let's say we're going to give 3% sodium chloride. We say we really want to get that stuff correct, or we're going to give her the, the, um, the concentrated stuff. So basically what we're going to do is to determine what that change in delta, uh, change in sodium is, right? And again, our number for this should be what? 12, right, because we want no more than 12 in that first 24-hour period, is going to equal the 513, which is the sodium concentration, 3% sodium chloride, minus the patient's serum sodium, which is 108. And then we're going to divide that by her total body water. So that's going to be 0.5 times her weight. And then it's going to be, and again, that's 60 kilograms. And then we're going to add one, right? So this is saying, well, how much would her serum sodium change if I were to give one liter of 3% sodium chloride? Okay. And again, that's why you have that one there. It's the volume of IV fluids. Again, this is a hypothetical thing. Okay, so that basically will equal, uh, equal out to 405 milliequivalents per liter divided by 31 <coughs> liters. Okay, so multiply that out, it's 31. <coughs> and then that's going to equal out to 13.06 milliequivalents per liter of 3% sodium chloride. That means that if I were to administer one liter to this patient of 3% sodium chloride, you should see a change of 13 milliequivalents per liter. Make sense so far? Now, again, is that too much, too little? It's too much, right? Because we said we want to shoot for a, vol uh, a change of 12. Okay, so basically we can figure out, okay, well, how much should we give in that 24-hour period? And we'll just take that uh, 12 divided by 13.06. So that's how much we know that one liter would change her serum sodium. And you come out to be 919 mLs of 3% sodium chloride. So then I can take that divided up by 24 hours, and I figure out how much I need to infuse per hour in order to get that change. So it really wouldn't take a whole lot of volume in order to get that patient corrected back up to 120. Do you have a question? Yeah. So okay. why can't you just put like 12 for the change of sodium and then just calculate? The so yeah, so at that point, what you could do is put in 12 here to solve for that, right? And then basically this would be your, your unknown, right? I would need to know how much volume I'm actually administering there. So this would be my X at that point, And then I could solve for that instead. Okay. Sometimes it makes sense a little bit more for people just to figure out, okay, well, how much is just one liter going to change and then figure it out from there, right? Uh, you don't have to do as much kind of manipulation on the equation. That was a silly question, but... Yeah. Um, could you also dilute the fluid with, let's say, I don't know, a little bit of B5 and play with it like that? So this way you're also giving her more fluids throughout the day? So that's a good question. Yeah, so if you're like, okay, well, what if I want to give her more volume, but I still want to get that sodium corrected? Well, I could use a less concentrated form of sodium chloride, right? So as a good comparison, that's a great segue. Thank you very much. What if we wanted to use 0.9% sodium chloride? Okay, let's do a comparison there to see how that change would occur. We're doing the same exact equation, but the only thing that's changed now, is instead of 513 being the concentration of sodium and the the volume, uh, the, uh, the fluid I'm giving, it's 154 now, right? Because we said that's 154 for normal saline. 0.9% sodium chloride is 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, okay? So now that I plug this in, 
what I end up being is that one liter of sodium chloride, normal saline, is 1.48. It's about one and a half milliequivalents change if I were to administer one liter of sodium chloride, normal, normal saline to that patient. Now, is that sufficient? No, right? So I would need to give more than that. So what I could do basically is say, well, my desired change is still 12. Well, let's do 12 divided by 1.48, and that equals 8.1 liters of normal saline throughout the 24-hour period. Now, is 8 liters a lot for a patient? That's a, that's a pretty decent amount, right? So again, if you think about normal human requirements, it's about 2 to 3 liters of water a day or fluid a day. Um, so that's probably a little too much. So maybe I could mix and match it, right? Maybe I give, say, half of that as 3% just to get her kind of changed quickly initially, and then I give the rest of it as normal saline, right? Maybe you could do that. Um, the trick is, though, is that which one do you think you're more likely to overcorrect with? The more concentrated one or the less concentrated one? Probably the more concentrated one, right? It's easier to get too much of it or too little of it because it's so concentrated. Even small changes in volume can mean big changes in the serum sodium versus 8.1 liters. That's a lot of volume to play with, right? So again, it's less, uh, it's, uh, you know, easier to, to not screw that up when you're using a less concentrated variety, okay? But that amount of volume may be way too much for the patients. That's why we would do something like, say, a 3% sodium choir. Because we said, what's this patient's volume status? If SIADH, so that they are euvolemic, right? So again, the volume is not their issue. Their issue is the fact that they have too much AVP that is causing them to hold on to too much water, which is diluting out their sodium, okay? So that's why you get into playing with that to say, okay, well, which one should I give? In this case, it might be make more sense to give that 3% sodium chloride in order to make sure that we correct it uh, without giving her too much volume, okay? Everyone with me so far? So again, I'm not gonna have you calculate that specifically on the test. That'd be kind of mean for me to do that. However, I want you to know the concepts here. Like, why are we, like, what, what does all this stuff mean? Like, what does it mean when I say, like, when I'm adding plus one to that equation there? Well, again, that's the one liter of fluid that I'm giving to that patient, right? Because, again, if I give you one liter of fluid, your total body water has gone up by one liter, right? Okay, it's kind of a closed system in that way. Um, anyway, so, again, be, be aware of that. And, again, we do these calculations all the time, especially in the ER when someone comes in and we suspect they're hyponatremic, right? We get the history. Um, we get the, the BMP comes back and it's low. We do these calculations to figure out how much volume we need to give and how much we can give, how quickly, and all of that. Now, let's say the patient came in, she's actively seizing. What are we going to do at that point, do you think? We'll just use like a standard dose basically of 3% saline. We would give a big dose um, up front and then we'd find out kind of where she was at afterwards. Like once she stopped seasoning, I figure out where they're at with a new serum sodium. And then we'll say, okay, well that fixed it. You know, say we fixed it by six milliequivalents per liter. Now for the rest of the 24 hour period, we have another six we can play with. And you'll do, similarly do that same, same equation there to figure out how much uh, to give over the rest of the day. Okay. So it's a little complicated, but again, the more you deal with it, the more you run into it, the more sense it'll make for you, right? And you can make up little scenarios for yourself and, and kind of um, uh, play with it. Anyway, um, so again, for non-emergent hypovolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia, again, they have low volume. This is where normal saline is going to be great. You don't want to use 3% because, again, it's too easy to overcorrect, and you're not giving them the extra volume they need. So that's why I like normal saline for that. So again, that's going to be good to replenish volume and the sodium. So um, getting into non-emergent euvolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. So let's say the patient is mildly symptomatic. You know, they're not seizing. You know, they're pretty much with mental status. They're maybe a little foggy, but they're not really, you know, uh, you know, too, too bad. This is where what we can do is, one, try to under get rid of the underlying cause. So if it's a medication, DC medication, you know, obviously if it was something like a head trauma, I can't really fix that, so to speak. It'll take time to recover. Um, but one thing you can do is try to restrict the water intake. Right, because again with SIDH, the main problem is not sodium handling; it's water handling. And so, if I can restrict their water, they're going to find it's going to be able to help to um, kind of re-equilibrate things and get the sodium back up to where it needs to be. Okay, so that's very frequent what we're going to do there. And sometimes we may actually give sodium chloride tablets and/or a loop diuretic to try to get either give extra sodium or to get rid of some of the extra volume there. Okay. And so again, I think patients like taking salt tablets. They're kind of gross, right? So again, sometimes we'll use uh, liquid formulations, especially if they're um, if like an intubate or something. That doesn't really matter because they're not really with it to to um, you know to taste it. But obviously, don't really like salt tablets. They're kind of gross, right? Anyway, um, other things we could do, right? So what if we could maybe um, maybe decrease the kidney's responsiveness to the ADH that's being secreted? 
This is where something called demeclocycline comes into play, and this is actually in the same class as a tetracycline. So just like we found doxycycline, tetracycline, minocycline, those all fall in the same category as demeclocycline. And so essentially what this does, it will inhibit the activity of AVP in the renal tubules, so you become less responsive to it, which means less of those aquaporin channels, which means more water is going to be exiting out as urine, okay? And so basically, if you have the kidneys being unresponsive to antidiuretic hormone, what do you call that? It's diabetes insipidus. So essentially what we're doing here is we're inducing a diabetes insipidus into these patients in order to get rid of that extra volume, right? So we're trying to get things equilibrated back to where it normally should be. So again, it makes sense. If I have a patient with SIDH, too much ADH, give them something that's going to be able to block the activity of that hormone and try to get things back into balance there a little bit, okay? Um, again, it takes a couple of days of work. So again, this is better for more non-emergent sort of cases there. Um, and again, think about things like, you know, well, who shouldn't take tetracyclines? Pregnant women, small kids, right? Because we're about the same same things, right? The the bone issues, the the teeth staining, all of that stuff. So just be aware of that. Um, again, this is not good for patients um, with say liver disease or, or kidney injury, anything like that, because again, this could exacerbate that a little bit. Other things we could do potentially are using vasopressin receptor antagonists. So I can give something that actually blocks those vasopressin receptors to prevent the aquaporin channels from being put there in the renal tubules in the first place. And so we kind of call these colloquially the, the Vaptans. As you, most of them will have Vaptan at the end of the name. So for instance, we have Conavaptan, we have Tolvaptan. We actually have one patient um, who is uh, on Tolvaptan right now in the cardiac unit. They're de uh, developing SIDH. Um, uh, this stuff is super, super expensive. We actually kind of treat it like gold almost. Uh, one little tiny tablet costs $500 a piece. And so we actually like keep it in the vault with all of our opioids and stuff like that because we don't want anything to happen to the medication. We'll make sure we keep a good track of it. But very, very expensive, usually used when other things have failed. Um, and so anyway, by using something that's going to block the activity of AVP, it's going to cause what we call aqui, it's going to be considered an aquaretic, right? So again, you're, you're just diuresing water at that point. Uh, so very, very useful. Um, beware the 12 vaptan is going to be metabolized by CYP3A4. So again, it's going to be prone to the same drug interactions and other things that may be blocking that, right? Um, and again, not good for appropriate or emergent correction of serum sodium. These are going to be more for the kind of the longstanding sort of more mild cases um, that are over the course of several days to weeks, okay? Again, if they are emergently hyponatremic, the best thing for them is actively seizing 3%, right? So again, if their serum sodium is that low, they're actively seizing or having very severe symptoms, 3% is going to be the way to go, okay? Okay. Um, so again, when you're having um, this hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, so the patient maybe has low effective arterial blood volume, they're uh, very dimidus, maybe they have ascites, maybe whatever the case may be, um, you need to have a negative water balance here, right? So again, the goal is to try to get rid of that extra fluid without trying to get rid of all that extra sodium. So one, correct the underlying cause. If they have low effective blood volume because they have low albumin, what can I give them? Well, I can give them albumin, right? So I can actually administer albumin intravenously to replace that oncotic pressure, okay? Um, and again, what do you consider, what type of fluid is albumin? It's a colloid, right? It's not a crystalloid like sodium chloride is, but it's a colloid uh, because it's protein-based. It provides that oncotic pressure versus just osmotic pressure, something like sodium chloride would do, right? Um, and again, we have varying concentrations of that. Sometimes you can give just 5%, there's 25%, there's varying varieties, but the low issue is low albumin, we can replace the albumin, right? Uh, also limit their fluid intake, limit their sodium intake. It's also gonna be very effective to try to limit um, their input. So that way their output is gonna be a little bit more effective at getting that volume off there, okay? And again, if the issue is more a, a problem of cardiac contractility, cardiac output, Something like digoxin can be useful, especially patients with CHF. Um, and then things like, you know, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, these are good for more um, uh, afterload reduction, right? Because these are going to help to um, decrease uh, vasoconstriction, help to open up the blood vessels a little bit more. That is also going to be somewhat useful for these patients. Most of them probably need to be on one anyway. Okay, um, now look at hypernatremia. So kind of flipping over from hypo to hypernatremia. Usually this is going to be due to... Um, either renal or extra renal fluid loss, right? So I'm getting rid of too much fluid, but not enough sodium in these cases here. Now, again, do you think you're more likely to run into hyponatremia or hypernatremia clinically, do you think? More frequently, hyponatremia is what you're going to run into, right? Uh, hypernatremia can still occur, but it's not quite as common. Um, the only thing I also forgot to mention with the hyponatremia is that very frequently we cause hyponatremia in our patients, and it's usually with the fluid selection that we make, right? So again, when you're giving patients maintenance fluids, give them like D5, half normal saline, D5 normal saline, which one do you think is more likely to cause hyponatremia? 
Well, anything that's hypotonic, right? So again, anything less than 0.9% is more likely to cause hyponatremia. So there's been a kind of a move, and again, I see this more in pediatrics, some, somewhat in adults. People, instead of using D5 half as their go-to maintenance fluid, more than often than not, they're using D5 normal, okay? Now again, what's the benefit of using D5 half versus D5 normal, do you think? Well, if I think they're intracellularly sort of depleted, maybe due to maybe long-standing, you know, nausea, vomiting, gastroenteritis, things like that, if I need to replenish the ICF, that's where using a hypotonic fluid can be useful there, right? You can give it and it's going to try to partition out to the ICF, kind of refill things a little bit from that standpoint, okay? But you're going to get into more trouble, more likely to see hyponatremia due to that. That's probably the most common cause of hyponatremia in the hospital is us giving it to the patient, okay? Anyway, um, you can also find issues hypernatremia from excess sodium ingestion. I'll never forget when I went on my honeymoon, uh, we decided to go to a sandals resort, uh, quite fancy. Um, but every morning they had this smoked marlin and smoked uh, some other fish. It was very good. Anyone know anything about smoked meats? It's very high in sodium. Uh, and boy, I love that stuff. Every single morning I'd go and have that stuff. And I will tell you the diaries that I, I had uh, the day after we left, was incredible. I was like, man, I'm losing all this weight. Where, where's it all going? It was all salt, really, right? <laughs> so again, sometimes it could be extra salt intake. Um, and again, typically what you're going to find is that with a hypovolemic hypernatremia, it could be due to diuretic use. It could be due to post-op diuresis in some cases. If it's more euvolemic, this is where you have things like diabetes insipidus, right? And again, diabetes insipidus is either just your brain's not sending out enough ADH or the kidneys are not responsive enough to it. You know any drugs can cause DI? Lithium's a big one. The methylcycline is another one, right? We just talked about that. Um, or it could be a primary polydipsia. Okay? And if it's hypervolemic, you do sodium overload, right? So there are uh, salt tablets, um, concentrated tube feedings. This is important from a nutrition standpoint if things are not diluted effectively. Uh, or if you have sodium-containing medications, right? Those are all things to consider. Um, more often than not, you're going to find that water loss happens due to insensible losses. What, is that? what are insensible losses? Sweating breathing, you know, things like that that you can't necessarily um, calculate effectively, right? I can't really tell how much someone's sweating throughout the course of a day, um, you know, but that's what I call it insensible versus sensible being things like the urine, the feces, things like that, I can directly measure, right? Um, and again, very frequently find hospitalized patients are not given enough free water to account for a lot of that. From the case of diabetes insipidus, there's a several varieties, right? There's central versus nephrogenic. Central just means the brain's not sending out enough AVP. Nephrogenic just means we're having a decreased kidney response to the arginine vasopressin. They become resistant to it for whatever reason there. And so that means we're going to have a large um, uh, loss of just free water, essentially, right? The very non-concentrated urine, you lose a lot of water, but that sodium stays behind, and that's where you get the hypernatremia that develops there. So as I mentioned, a lot of causes for this. I'm not going to get into all of them, um, but if you think about central causes of uh, diabetes insipidus. This is things like neurosurgery, head trauma. So not only can these things cause SIDH, but they can also cause a DI to occur as well. So sometimes it can be either or. Um, ethanol ingestion, right? Isn't there the, the term breaking the seal? What does that mean? Yeah, once you go once to the bathroom and you're imbibing uh, uh, ethanol, which I know none of you do during this 27 month period, um, perhaps the day after or the night of, whatever. Um, but you're going to find that that will cause a central decrease in AVP release, which means you're going to have much more water being released. That's why you have a lot of diuresis that occurs along with alcohol ingestion. And again, a lot of patients get dehydrated, may find a little bit of hypernatremia. What's interesting, though, um, you know what? Electrolyte abnormality happens to patients who are chronically drinking a lot of beer. It's a term called beer potomania. They actually get hyponatremic because does beer have a lot of sodium in it? Is zero sodium in it. So you actually get hyponatremic from just beer ingestion, right? So you have these like chronic drinkers that just drink a ton of beer. Maybe they're really down with like the Natty Light or the Beast Light or something. That's like their main source of fluid intake. They tend to get hyponatremic, right? So just something to think about. Um, from a nephrogenic cause, this is where you're going to find more medications are playing a role here. So things like lithium, amphotericin B, right? That makes sense. We talked about the electrolyte wasting and the impaired concentrating effects due to amphotericin B. That's another reason why you might see that. The meclocycline, the Vaptans, those are intentional, right? We're trying to cause a DI in the patient to try to get rid of some of that extra volume and someone has SIDH, right? So, and again, clinically, you're going to find that you're having a shift from the ICF over to the ECF. So that causes a lot of polyuria because you have this extra volume here. And again, looking at this, you're going to find that typically patients will tolerate much higher sodium levels. They, they tolerate hypernatremia much better than they do hyponatremia. And so you may find some patients who develop seizures, but it's not up until like the 160s, right? So again, they can um, get pretty high on their sodiums before you really see any true clinical sort of uh, concerns there. Um, 
And again, you're going to find that the acute presentations tend to be much more symptomatic than the more chronic ones, just because they've had time to kind of re re-equilibrate. So our goals here, you want to get them down to a sodium level of 145, right, the high end of normal there. Um, and again, you may find that too rapid of a correction, just like we talked about, if you too rapidly create hyponatremia and cause water to rush out of the brain, all the cells to shrink, the opposite is going to occur here. If I go from hypernatremic to unatremic too quickly, you're going to find cerebral edema can happen. So that, that you have to be careful with. Um, and once you do uh, correct them, usually trying to make sure that you kind of restrict sodium intake, try to get that fluid replaced is going to be useful there, right? So again, if you have someone, now let's say for instance, you have someone who has um, a serum sodium, say of like 165, and I want to give them IV fluids, what is a good IV fluid to administer? Should I use normal saline? Should I use half normal saline, quarter normal saline? Which one's going to tend to correct them more quickly? Probably the quarter normal saline, right? The thing you have to think about though is what is the relative concentration of sodium in the volume of the fluid I'm giving versus what they're already at. So if they are at 160, but I'm giving normal saline, that's 154. It's not probably going to cause a very big shift there. But if they're 160 and I give them half normal saline, which half normal says only 77, you're going to see a big shift that happens there. Okay. So again, be careful with your fluids you're using. You tend to correct them too quickly, so which is a time to kind of equilibrate. You can cause that cerebral swelling to occur. Okay. Um, again, how we're going to manage this for hypovolemic hypernatremia, normal saline typically is going to be okay for these patients there because, again, it's going to help to get that volume back up, and then you can switch over to something like half normal saline, D5. Typically, you're not going to give D5 by itself, but occasionally you may do it uh, every once in a while. And, again, typically you're going to shoot for no more than a correction of 10 to 12 mil equivalents per liter per day, just like we saw with correcting hyponatremia. Hyper should probably be roughly the same there as well. Okay. Um, for this central diabetes insipidus, basically what you can do if the brain's not sending out enough AVP is I can just give them more AVP, right? So I can actually give them um, desmopressin, which is a, a name for DDAVP. It's basically a synthetic form of arginine vasopressin or ADH. And it actually has poor oral bioavailability, so we actually give this via a nasal spray. So if you ever see a patient um, receiving this uh, via nasal spray, it's probably for either uh, diabetes insipidus, or in actually in some cases, vasopressin can also be used to um, activate certain clotting factors, like von Willebrand's factors. So you may see a few hemophiliac patients who are actually on this as well. It's kind of a, um, another use you may see occasionally. But um, again, the goal here is to make sure you're adequate, if adequate urinary concentrations of sodium. Um, and again, this can be used as well for um, you know, patients having a, a lot of uh, you know, polyuria at nighttime, you can administer this and that will help them kind of hold on more of that fluid so they don't have as much urge to get up and go to the bathroom all the time or less bed wetting, things like that. Um, however, giving too much desmopressin increases that risk for water intoxication. What is, it, what is water intoxication? So it's happy hour, I'm like, let me get the two for one waters. And they say, you've had too much water already, man. I'll say, I'll tell you when I've had too much water. That water. No, it's basically when you have way too much water coming in. So again, that thirst response gets kicked in. When you give that desmopressin, they get too much free water, and you can sometimes overcorrect, and that can be a problem as well. Okay, be, be watchful of that. Um, so anyway, so you're gonna be watching for the signs: hyponatremia, hypovolemia, all of that that goes along with that. Okay, if you have a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, obviously if it is a certain drug that's causing that, like a lithium or demeclocycline or something like that, you can DC the drug. It's usually going to be the most common thing to do there. And then just kind of replacing the electrolytes and maybe um, abnormal, right? So calcium, potassium, whatever you need to fix there. Um, generally, you need to induce a little bit of an extracellular fluid deficit. Um, so in some cases, by giving a thiazide along with uh, cutting the salt intake, that can help to kind of correct things a little bit faster as well. And that can then um, help to um, get rid of some of that uh, or try to slow down that volume uh, loss there and kind of get things corrected a little bit more uh, quickly there. Um, and actually, in some cases, you may see endomethacin being used. Does anyone know where we saw endomethacin before? What category it falls into? Uh, actually, an NSAID. Yeah, actually, NSAIDs can actually potentiate the activities of AVP, which makes sense because we saw this before. We saw NSAIDs can actually cause an SIDH kind of effect. This is the case here where endomethacin is useful because it can actually cause AVP to work better. And so, again, you get less uh, polyuria associated with that. It's going to be good. And then uh, for sodium overload, obviously they're getting way too much sodium in and say, hey, you've had 40 pounds of so uh, smoked marlin over the week of your honeymoon. Um, you basically say, well, just limit the sodium intake. That's obviously going to be the best thing to do. And then loops can actually help to facilitate some of that sodium excretion there. Um, or you can try to give something with no sodium in it, so like D5 potentially. But again, less common than um, you may think. So that is it for the nephro stuff. I apologize for not getting to... The Kahoot in class, but do you have any questions that I can answer? This is the end of the material for test three. Again, just know there's going to be a few pediatric calculations there, just a couple. 
Um, and I'll do the review. I'll kind of narrate it. We'll go through it. Uh, and I'll post up the actual cahoots and do along along with me. Uh, nothing else. Let me check the the.